what are the key benefits of fasting that you have seen in your patients? Traumatic. You know, I've been a cardiologist for 30 years, and I've tried everything. But when I tried fasting, I started seeing changes. People began to lose weight. People's blood pressures came down. Diabetes got reversed. The progression of coronary artery disease went down. You see, I had the benefit of seeing patients from day one. So I saw that they were having a second angioplasty, another heart attack in two years, five years. I saw the numbers going down on those whom I was able to get them to lose weight through a di uh, fasting program. And I tried lots of fa uh, diet programs. They didn't seem to work, but fasting did. So decreased blood pressure, decreased diabetes, uh, rehospitalization. LV function seemed to stay good, which means that heart muscle function continued to do well. Patients mentally also seemed to be doing better. So fasting gave me not just this benefit, but a lot more. Also, my patients didn't end up in the hospital with fractures or falls and had stronger muscles and, and mentally they were better. Uh, so I started seeing that just generally patients were doing better. ER doctors telling me, how come your, your patients don't end up in the ER with acute heart attacks? Um, all these benefits I saw with yeah. uh, fasting. With, with all these, you know, quite different benefits that you've just outlined for us, why is it do you think that very few medical doctors are promoting fasting with their patients? Of course, as you've demonstrated, it has huge benefits. It's very effective. It's also kind of free of charge. So why is there such a resistance among you know, like our profession, to recommend this as a treatment? It's a tough sell, and it takes time. You see, you're only as good as getting into your patient's brain. Can you get in there and make them make those changes? And that's a tough one, yeah. because yeah. all you're doing is you're giving them the advice. There's no tools for me to give them. There's no tablets to give to them. they got to make that effort. And all i got to do is get into their brain change the way they think. And if they get convinced that, yes, Doc is telling me something that resonates inside me and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make that change, um, then they'll do it. So the trouble is that most of the doctors are too busy. We're actually taking care of disease processes rather than prevention. Here, we're really talking about a lifestyle change. And that's the hard part about fasting and talking to someone about fasting. Physicians find it very difficult to talk to them about that because you can just tell them that, okay, these are the benefits. That's not good enough. Um, it takes much more than that. It's a deeper dive into the patient's lifestyle. How do you wake up in the morning? How do you feel in the morning? What are the main issues in your life? So it's, it's not just about fasting. It's about your relationships. Who are you? Um, what's your life all about? Uh, all that affects your diet. Because see, Fasting is also about, it's much more, it's about your whole life. It's about who do you think you are and can you empower yourself to do it? Or yeah, are you yeah. just a slave to your day-to-day -day routines and advertising? So to get somebody to fast, you really need to change their, their whole outlook on who they are. You are not your habits. You are not even your body. You are something that can change everything. There's a separate part of you besides your body, even your mind. There's a separateness. There's an awareness inside you. And if I can get into that awareness, then I can empower you. Yeah, and if yeah. I can empower you, then I can make you fast. So doing this whole thing, it's not easy for most physicians. And, uh, you know, even, even, even people who are dedicated to teaching people about diet, it's a hard sell. Yeah, and I yeah. think that our approach has to change. Our approach, I first look at patients and I have to empower them to say, you know, you are more than what you think you are. You can do it. Your videos on YouTube have been going viral for a number of years now. And, you know, I've read a lot of the comments and I've watched a lot of those videos. And I think what one of the many things people deeply resonate with you and your message about is this real passion to help people and this real passion to empower people. And, and I, I want to sort of dive in there a little bit because 
you are, you know, a, a very well-respected cardiologist. You literally go into people's hearts, you put in stents, you do all this kind of stuff. In some ways, you know, as life-saving as putting a stent in someone's heart potentially can be, you know, it's slightly disempowering, isn't it? It's kind of like, well, I've got to rely on the skill and ability of my doctor to be good at what he does, to be sharp on the day, to have slept properly the night before, right? Those, the, All these things are out of my control as a patient. Whereas pretty much everything you're talking about and we're going to go through in detail today, it's about putting the patient back in control of their health. And I guess I would argue their wider happiness as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and that's the thing, that the patients have to take responsibility because the medical profession, the way it's set up right now, we, we, we just, we, we're not in a position to do that. We have to, you know, we don't have enough resources. We don't have enough time. So what we can do is we can educate patients and we can throw light on the issues that have brought them to where they are now and show them how they can get out of it, show them, empower them and educate them so that they make their decisions. And when they make their decisions, they will do it. Yeah, and then yeah. it's, it's, it's self-empowering. It feeds back on themselves and say, look, look, I was able to do this and I didn't think I could do this. And, and so that brings us to that issue that there are so many layers of onions that we can peel off and fasting is the one that really seems to me to open up aspects of their lifestyle which they would not have otherwise looked at because fasting does bring in lots of issues into their life it opens up the introspection into their life it's what's going on what's driving these things in my life yeah, and that's yeah. what i like about fasting it's, it's it's so different i mean imagine if i just give them a diet and say okay you're just going to eat this um okay they're going to eat that that's it but in fasting, it's self-control. It's, it's deeper thinking about the habits and all the other things that we, we're going to talk about. Yeah. In many ways, fasting is, you know, really swimming against the tide of societal norms because we live in a society of abundance, Yet fasting is self-imposed scarcity. And, you know, we're going to talk about fasting from food and the benefits for various different disease processes, but also for promoting health and well-being. But you could take it a little step further, couldn't you? If we're going to sort of link mind and body and heart all together, well, it's not just about fasting from food, is it? It's, it's also we can take social media fasts. We can take alcohol fast, we can take caffeine fast, even that term fasting, it goes far beyond just food really, doesn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. You have so much insight into this. You've just hit onto something very important. When we talk about our habits in fasting and our addiction really to eating and this pattern, you also talked about digital addiction. You almost just you didn't quite say it in that way, but it, there is digital addiction, there's alcohol addiction, there's gambling addiction, there's other forms of addictions, and sugar addiction, and all these things seem to go to that part of the brain that gives us that reward. So we're living in a society where it's all about the instant rewards. And when you prime yourself in one area, you can slip into other areas as well. And that brings up this whole addiction thing that perhaps this pattern of eating that we've developed and this addictive pattern of eating every few hours all the time, it's really an addiction. It is an addiction. And it, it seems to give us that instant reward. And it doesn't really matter what you're eating, but it's the fact that you're eating all the time and we need to get out of this. Yeah. So we need to yeah. really look at our whole life to say that, look, the dopamine centers are primed already from a young age. And um, yes, we are addicted. We're an addicted society. You, you know that the, the book that I just finished reading a few months ago, um, Dopamine Nation, I think it's called. Yeah. yeah, fascinating insights that you know you prime yourself in one area and then you'll slip into another addiction very easy. And I think that food is one of them. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm convinced that food is one of them. Um, so yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It is, it's, it's a whole lifestyle. And, and I tell my patients that if you really want to come off your current eating habits, we need to look at your whole life as well. 
Are you addicted to alcohol? Are you addicted to to caffeine? Are you addicted to sugar? Are you addicted to even digital uh, uh, media? Um, because it's just the way we're priming ourselves. Yeah, yeah. And when they start looking to that, they do see insights. That, oh my God, he's right. They, they, you know, I am probably addicted to this pattern, and I can get out of it. If you enjoyed that clip, here's another powerful clip that I think you are really going to enjoy. Just one dose of caffeine in the evening decreased the amount of deep sleep by 20%. You would have to normally age by about 15 years to produce that type of a deficit in your deep sleep. Or you can do it every single night by having a cup of coffee.